All right, welcome everyone. Uh, before I start, I'd like to ask a few questions. Um, so I would like to know who in this room is using Spring Boot already. Right, about 50%. Uh, for those of you who are using Spring Boot, are you still, raise your hand if you're still using Spring Boot 1. Time to upgrade, time to upgrade. Right. Some Spring Boot 1 was end of life in August, this summer, so it's definitely time to upgrade if you have any issues with that um, and you want to chat. We can use the opportunity, uh, uh, just ping me on Twitter. Or if you see me at the, at the conference today or tomorrow, I'm happy to chat with you and, and figure out what's going on with your app. Right, so if you've seen a, a talk on Spring for the past two years, and it was related to uh, web apps, um, you know about this new uh, programming model in Spring Framework 5 uh, that allows you to build an application uh, in a reactive fashion using Project Reactor and a publish-subscribe mechanism. Uh, so that's the new options that you can see on your left. And of course, um, no reason to um, uh, remove what you already use. So if you're using Spring MVC with a servlet contract and imperative model where you have one thread per connection, uh, one thread per request, basically, uh, that mechanism still exists, of course. There's um, no plan whatsoever to uh, remove support for that. So we've been telling you a lot um, with Spring Framework 5 and Spring Boot 2, whoops, uh, you have now two options. You can either use the existing Spring MVC model with, with a servlet API uh, and one request per, one thread per um, request, or you can use um, the new uh, reactive infrastructure, uh, which will help you to to scale and to better use resources. So there are very specific use cases where it might be uh, it might be useful. So we've been telling you that a lot, and today I'm here to tell you that um, there's actually a third option. Uh, a third option is to have an existing Spring MVC app and use some of the reactive features on the back end. So we. Basically, the Spring team uh, is there to give you as many options as we can. So um, this is what I would like to showcase to you today. So it's basically a mix of the two. Um, and it will help you uh, getting started with the reactive stack where it makes sense. And maybe that will give you the opportunity to go uh, full reactive for uh, some of your apps. So enough with the talking. Uh, this, this session is mostly live coding. Uh, it's the session right before lunch, so I'm, I'm guessing you should be pretty tired al already. So let's start with a use case. Um, so we are going to build an app, and this app will go around uh, StartupSpring.io, which I don't know if you've seen it as some uh, Halloween style at the moment. So if you go on StartupSpring.io, this is what you, you should see. And every time you generate a project, uh, we actually collect a snapshot of the request. So we basically look at the decisions you've made, the choices that you've made, the build system you've chosen, the dependencies you've chosen, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's a way for us to better understand how the community uses Spring. And it's not only about the web UI, right? I'm, I'm sure you know that you can uh, get started with Spring from start of Spring.io, but also from your ID, uh, be it IntelliJ, ID, uh, Eclipse, NetBeans, or VS Code, they all have integration for start of Spring.io. So you can generate the project directly from your ID. Uh, there's also command line support. So basically, any of those use cases will, will take a snapshot. And what we are going to do today is we are going to build a dashboard application. So the purpose of the dashboard is to show some metrics about project generation. And for the sake of this um, example, we are going, we will have to use uh, some existing services. We won't be able to uh, change. So that will be a given. There are three of them, actually four of them. There is an event, uh, events service that tells you about stuff that happened within the time range of the request. There is the project um, service, of course, which gives you statistics about project generation 
uh, per, um, per generation of Spring Boot. And there is an IP lookup mechanism uh, that tells you um, um, IPs that might be abusing the system. And because we don't want to show the IP, but we want to show a name, we also have a DNS resolution uh, system where you have to give it one IP at a time to get back the name. So it would be unfortunate. It would be easier if you would send uh, the IPs you're interested in that by batch and getting a, a batch result. But unfortunately, that service is like that. You can't change, you can't change it. Right? So these are the three services that we have. And we already have an existing application. Uh, don't worry. This application and everything that I'm going to showcase today, even more, I suppose, uh, 15 minutes is, is probably not enough to cover everything. Everything is on GitHub, so you'll have a chance to revisit that uh, later. So this project has basically two um, applications. There is a generator, which simulates the data. right? So there is some app running on port 8081. And what it does, it implements the four services I was talking about. It will give you random data uh, so that you can uh, display that in the UI. And there is the dashboard application, which calls those services. And this is the one uh, we are going to work on today. So if you haven't seen that yet, right? Um, let's go back to the main app, so the dashboard application. And this is, this is already what we have, right? So uh, on this main page, uh, we, this is really the, the core of the, of the demo today. Uh, we'll have this, we have the statistics of project generation. We have the um, top IPs, so the temp top, top IPs with the resolution, a very smart resolution, as you can see. And there is some events. So let's go back to actually showing in practice what those services do so that there is no uh, mystery around it. So this is the statistic one on port 81. It just gives you a JSON structure with the data. There is an event, uh, which at the, mom at the moment all only gives you one event. And uh, there is a top IPs that just gives you random IPs that might be abusing the system. OK, so let's have a look to the app. Uh, so the dashboard one, we're going, we are going to focus on the dashboard one. We're not go going to touch the generator much. It's a regular Spring MVC using Timeleaf and uh, the regular Spring Boot Starter web. So that's running in Tomcat, uh, basically the vanilla web applications you may have. Uh, this application has a class which uh, abstracts the access to remote resources, right? So these are the three calls I just showed you on 8081. And there is a method here um, that's the core of uh, retrieving the data and potentially where some optimization may be applied. So we uh, get the statistics here. We get the events. And then we get the IPs. And uh, there is some optimization going on here. So for each IP we have, remember, you have to call the DNS lookup one by one. So we basically loop over those, uh, call the reverse lookup uh, service. We get back the, the, the uh, name of the address. And we build a container based on that. And that container eventually is going to be put in uh, in some model at this URI of the dashboard, right? So you invoke the dashboard app, it, fe it feeds a model, the model goes back to the time lift template, and that's how you get the UI. So this is what we have, right? And it's an MVC app, one thread per uh, request. So let's improve it with the third option I was talking about. And one way to improve it is to basically bring WebFlux on the class path. So you know that WebFlux is the new option. Um, I was showing it in the slide. Web is for MVC apps running on Tomcat, and WebFlux is basically the reactive infrastructure and the uh, project reactor base um, um, support. Right. So um, if you've ever done with HTTP with Spring, um, HTTP call with Spring, you know about the REST template. Um, and in Spring Boot, we offer you 
all kinds of uh, facilities so that you don't have to worry about converters and security and tracing and monitoring, etc., etc. We provide you a builder you can inject in your own component, and that builder will have uh, everything that Spring Boot has detected, all the added features that Spring Boot has auto-configured based on your class pass. Um, based on that builder, you can very easily create a REST template instance, and then you can call it the way, uh, the usual way. Webflux comes with a new uh, web client uh, that's reactive by nature. Uh, that's, it's called web client. So what I'm going to do, the first demo, I'm going to switch to that, right? And we want the upgrade uh, process to be as smooth as possible. So if you decide to go away from REST template to the new web client, which has a, a more modern, modern API, then you'll find uh, the same facilities, right? We also inject a builder with all kinds of things auto-configured for you. And the API is, is slightly different because we had a chance to revisit 12 years of REST template API, right, starting from scratch. So we, we've changed things a bit, but it, it feels more or less the same. All right, so what I'm going to do now is uh, I am going to change those methods so that they express the fact uh, uh, that there is potential, lat potential latency or potentially uh, some I.O. going on or potentially something for which the threat will, will block will wait. And uh, this is the publish-subscribe mechanism uh, in a reactive application. You probably know that in Reactor, it's implemented with two types. So the publisher is implemented with two types, a time called mono, which express the fact that a publisher will emit zero or one value, and a type called flux, which uh, uh, describes the fact that a publisher will emit n elements, potentially an infinite number of elements. So in the case here, I'm doing a get on that URI, that attribute. All right. And what I want to do is I want to return a publisher, which eventually is going to give me uh, the generation statistics. So that's the, the object that I'm interested in. There we go. So this is, this is how you change it from REST template to web client. But know that you no longer return the data. You return a publisher to the data. Right? So something eventually will subscribe to that publisher uh, to get the information. But this method is not doing anything until someone subscribes to it. We'll see later how that, that works in, in practice. If you want to return a list, I told you there is mono and flux. So if you want to return a, li a list, you'll rather use flux for that. And the call is a bit similar. You have a get on a URI, pass the parameter, retrieve, and this time you do body.flex with the target type, OK? The difference here is, um, whereas previously you had a list of events, which basically means that the HTTP call would be issued, you'll get data back. You'll buffer, it, buffer, it, um, you'll buffer the data back in memory. Uh, transform the JSON into a value object, the event class we have here, and then build a list. And once the, build, uh, once the list has been fully completed, let's say you have like a large number of events. It's not the case here, but let's imagine for statistics that, makes, that probably makes more sense. Um, then only the, the return value will be available to the, the caller once you've read the, the entire body of the remote call. Right? With a flux, it's, it doesn't work that way. Uh, a publisher will emit an event every time there is a new value, um, as expressed by the, the component that basically subscribed to it. And there is no need for the full list to be completely read or completely put in memory or bufferized or whatever uh, to be a, to, uh, for the caller to be able to read already some elements. So I'm not going to change everything. So there, you see, you, as you see, there is one more thing to change and a bit more um, uh, bit more things to do in the caller. So let's just check out that. And I'll show you now the end result. So the, the end result now is that you have those block operation. 
If you have a full reactive using Spring Web Flux and Netty, uh, you probably know it's uh, something you should never do, right? You should never block uh, in a reactive application because um, then potentially, if you block all the threads that, that are responsible for data processing, your application won't do anything anymore. But remember, this is Spring MVC Tomcat, one thread per request. So if you, if you block, you basically subscribe to the publisher and wait until the data is ready, right? So let's have a look to the app. It's not very interesting, of course. It's doing exactly the same as before. Right. So it's doing the same thing. So you haven't gained much. Uh, except now, uh, you have it within the API, you have those calls that are um, showing very clearly that those things potentially have a latency involved in them, right? It's part of the signature. So now you are in, in, you are in this infrastructure where some uh, uh, network reality or a network related or IO bound operation uh, are clearly described. You can go one level up and you can actually compose a bit more using operators available on Flux and Mono. So that's the next thing, the, the next level, right? Um, you can see here um, three distinct operations, actually four. We retrieve the statistics, we retrieve the event, we retrieve the top IPs, and then once we have the, the top IPs, we need to call a fourth service to get the name. But all those operations, for the sake of that method body here, are completely independent, right? You don't care um, about whether statistics will come first or events will come first or IPs. All it matters is at some point you need the stats containers to be filled. And if you had to do it, to do it with uh, regular Spring MVC and the REST template, what you would do probably is um, configure a thread pool. And then in each thread, you would issue the, the HTTP call yourself and make sure to join, make sure to wait on those three threads, or maybe four threads, really. And once you get the list of IPs, you would spawn other, th other threads again uh, to uh, do the DNS resolution. If you've done that, you know it's not so easy uh, to implement, so there is some uh, concurrency issue. What if there is a timeout somewhere? Uh, so it's, it's really not easy. So what I want to show you is how you can go one level up with this infrastructure and use Project Reactor to compose this, this logic. So to go further, the third thing we are going to do is stop blocking here, but rather reuse the publisher. Right? I'm going to do this for the three uh, elements I'm interested in. Note that this one uh, returned a flux here, but I get a mono of list of event. That's because there is an operator called collect list. And what that operator will do, it will subscribe to a flux, accumulate the element in a list, and once the, the publisher says there is no more data, it will emit a single event with the list. So the, the return tab that you see here is a publisher that will emit one element, and the one element is of type list of event. I want the same thing for this guy here, so the resolve IP. Let's call that top clients, and I need to do something to get those top clients. So. Um, I need the range, and I'm going to, co to call collect list again here. All right. For some reason, it didn't get that. OK. OK. So in, uh, you've noticed I called, I called collect list again right here. Because this method, I, I, just, want to be, I just want it to be idiomatic, the fact that at some point, we want to collect that list uh, into a single event. That's just a, an implementation detail. I want the method to actually express uh, what it's supposed to do, which means a flux of resolved IP. So in order to do that, 
um, I need to well get the the top IP piece in the first place. And for each of them, I need to call my DNS service, right? So for that, there is an operator called FlatMap. You probably know about FlatMap if you've used uh, the, the Stream API in Java 8 and, and further. Which, what it's going to do, it's going to subscribe individually for each element that we get. And it retur re re will return you a flux of uh, the type that, that has been mapped. And what we want to map is this one here. So this is going to give us an IP. And for each of them, we want to do the reverse lookup. So there is an interesting side effect by doing that. Remember I told you about um, if you issue an HTTP call and it's returning you a JSON array, um, and you materialize that in your API as a flux of the type, you don't have to wait for the, for the full body to be read to be able to, to consume it. As soon as you already have read a bit of data and deserialize that to, to an object, that object is going to be emitted eventually, and you can react to it. So concretely, what happens here um, depending on resource, of course, if you have enough resources on, on the server at that point, is the, the, the call is issued to get the top IPs. Um, you read the something, read the first element, emit the first element to the mapping, and the mapping can already issue a DNS resolution while the, the rest of the body is being read. Okay? And the other element is um, there is no reason to keep that list in memory, or there is no, no need to buffer it, because it's just a pipeline where you get the IP and you issue another call to get the host name. Of course, this is like a very sim simple example, because there's only 10 elements. Uh, the IP is a POJO with one field. But imagine what, how you could use that with a more complex API. OK, so I have my top client here. So this is my three publisher. So I still have nothing, right? I still have three publishers that will emit the data that I need. So now I need to subscribe to those. And uh, as I told you, I don't care how the, the calls are going to be issued. I want them to be as fast and as efficient as possible. There is no relationship between them. So I just need something for me that would uh, automatically implement the threat pool uh, mechanism I told you about. In Reactor, there is uh, an operator that does that called zip. And zip, you give it a bunch of publishers, and it will subscribe to them. And once it gets the data, it will give you back a value object with the data. So I want to subscribe to stats, events, and top clients. And I want to map that. So I'm getting some object. Uh, where's my builder? There you go. So this is the, the logic that um, once you have the data, uh, that uh, you can uh, fill in the container. OK, so um, generation stat is the first argument, so that's T1. Uh, events is the second, so that's T2. And I have a T3, which is my top IPs. And of course, I need to return that. And this is the old code I don't need anymore. And you no longer return a stats container from this method, but re you return a publisher of a stats container. So you return something that when someone will subscribe to it, will express an interest, I need that data now, I'm, I'm ready to consume it, that will trigger the whole chain, right? So this is a definition. This is not actually running code until someone subscribes to the publisher. So let's fix that. 
And of course, something needs to subscribe to it. So one way to do it is to block here at the, ver the highest level in the chain, right? So you block at the highest level in the chain, and you let Reactor uh, compose your business logic, your operations, as, efficiency, as efficiently as possible. All right. So we still have the app. The app is still running. Um, and I have a build failure here, right? Uh, just to give you an opportunity to show you how you can test that stuff very easily. If you don't know about uh, WebMVC test and uh, mock MVC feature in it. So the, the, the API has changed. It's not returning a stats container, but it's returning a mono stats container. So in, in the test, I could uh, create another operator of Project Reactor, which is called Just. And in the case of a test, if you have the instance already, you can uh, very easily create a publisher for it. Um, so this is what I'm doing here. OK. Right, so this is like a uh, happy path. Everything is, uh, is working just fine. Uh, all those optimizations are probably completely useless because anyway, so the service is super fast. And we don't care about anything. But let's, let's, let's change that. Uh, I have a latency service. Of course, blue on black, that's not going to work very well. Every time, I re every time I remember on stage, that's the wrong uh, color. But anyway, um, on the back end, I have a service that I can use to introduce a fake latency for something. And uh, maybe you'll see it, but the ratio at the moment is 0%, and the range is uh, 200 milliseconds to 8 seconds. So basically, what that means is for 0% of the requests at the moment, uh, we can add a fake latency between 200 milliseconds and 8 seconds. So I'm, I'm going to change the ratio, uh, if I remember how to do that. Like that. So I've changed it to be 80%. OK, so it's not working that fast anymore. Uh, it's actually pretty slow. Um, Let's have a look to my app. OK. Everything seems to be fine, seems earthy. Uh, let's actually show you a bit more detail. More details. Nothing is really really, really bad. But my app has a, has a problem. So I know what the problem is, but you don't. Uh, so we need to figure out now where the problem could be, right? Um, and if, if, you, if you've been uh, using uh, the, the gauge service and the counter service in Spring Boot 1, uh, you know there is a way to expose metrics to a number of, of monitoring systems. In Spring Boot 2, we've leveraged a new project called Micrometer. Who knows about Micrometer? A few of you. So the, the tagline for Micrometer is, it's like SLF4J, but, but for metrics. So the purpose of the project is to give you a uh, monitoring system independent API uh, on, that you can use to define gauge and and counters, and uh, metrics, and customize a bunch of things. And then there is a concept of registry, where um, Micrometer implements that API on top of a bunch of monitoring systems. So there is support for Datadog, for Prometheus, for Wavefront. So there is really a bunch of monitoring systems you can use. And um, given that this application is slow, um, we are going to monitor it. So I'm going to show you how you can do that. Uh, I'll show. I'll use Prometheus here. So, the first thing I need to do is I need to add. I wish it, w it would call it something I can remember. There you go. So you need to add a registry. So you need to add 
an implementation of that API. If you add Prometheus, so Prometheus is a bit different from the other um, uh, monitoring system. Most monitoring system, you push metrics to them. So for instance, if you use Datadog, you have an API token. Uh, so you have a subscri subscription with them. You have an API token. And every now and then, the Spring Boot application itself will push metrics to uh, Datadog. Prometheus is really different. Uh, Prometheus has this concept of a scrap endpoint. So you expose an endpoint in your application with a given format. And Prometheus has a job to call you. So it's basically calling you to get the metrics. As you might suspect, uh, if you have a Spring Boot application, there is nothing to do. Uh, there is a Prometheus endpoint that's going to be exposed automatically whenever the registry is on the class path. Um, but right now, it is um, secure. As you can see, I had to log in, so it's, it's not going to work. And I, I'm, going to show, I'm going to show you in a minute how to fix that. Something else also I would like to do is I would like to identify the metrics as being from this particular application, right? Uh, because if you have one monitoring system, you may monitor hundreds of applications. So you need a way to tell the monitoring system that those metrics are coming from a, from a given place. Um, Micrometer has this notion of tags. Uh, you can use as many tags as you want, and you can use that for, for filtering, typically. So I'm going to add a tag called application, and I'm going to give it the name uh, initializer dashboard. All right. So I need to restart the app since I've added something on the class pass. So let's. <laughs> there we go. So I have Prometheus running. Um, I forgot to show you actually the the job, but there is a there is a YAML file you can add for to Prometheus where, where you basically have. You can define scrap jobs where you say, please collect metrics from those places. And you can see at the moment it's complaining uh, because it can't, it can't access uh, the data as it's secure. So let me show you first the, the definition. You can see that we have a job name Prometheus, um, which goes to uh, the Prometheus, Prometheus instance running on my machine, so it's basically scrapping itself. And there is a spring job. Every five seconds, it goes to localhost 8080 and localhost 8081. So it's basically monitoring both the generator and the dashboard. OK, so um, right. So this is this, my security config. As you can see, it's very concise. And it has also, um, if you don't know about that because uh, you've not uh, used Spring Boot 2 yet, um, in Spring Boot 2, there is a dedicated support for the actuator and Spring Security. So we implement uh, some API that you can use to compose your security configuration more easily, rather than having stuff at multiple places like it used to be in Spring Boot 1. So this is a demo. So of course, I'm going to tell the Prometheus endpoint can do anything. Um, if you have a real application, you, you may configure some kind of API token and pass the API token to the Prometheus. Um, uh, script. Right. Um, so you've noticed also that I didn't restart my application very often, even though I made a bunch of changes. Um, the reason why um, I did that is because this application is using DevTools. I'm wondering who knows about Spring Boot DevTools? OK, quite a lot. So for those of you who don't know that, it's a single dependency you add to your application. And what it will do, it will run your application in a mode where it scans, it watches uh, your class path. So it watches the classes being compiled by your ID or whatever process you use to compile your code. And when a class change, it will detect that because the timestamp has changed. And it will restart your app automatically with the, the new content. Uh, it's also coupled with uh, live reload support. So this is the little plugin here I've added. Um, nothing to do with Spring. It's something that you can use for uh, regular web development. Um, and uh, it will connect your browser to a server uh, that's running on the same machine. When you run DevTools, we also start a mini uh, live reload server so that the browser and the server can communicate. And um, 
once the application has been restarted, the, the live reload server will trigger an event. It will send an event to the browser saying, please refresh the tab. And that's why you can see that I'm, I'm now on the login page without me actually refreshing. So it's still slow. But the difference now, because uh, that should have stopped complaining. Yes. All right. So it's still slow. It's not fixed, of course. But now we have some data. So let's have, let's ha let's have a look to the data. So you can have a look to the raw data, uh, which is no fun, ex uh, except if you want to debug. So this, th these are all the, the metrics that you can see um, that are currently harvested uh, by this primitive instance. Let's have a look to the server request <laughs> seconds max. So this is basically a value of the maximum time a server request took on a, on a given path. So these are the, these are the tags that, you can, uh, that are currently exposed. And you can see a 7, seven not 8 seconds there, which looks a bit like very close to 8 seconds. Right? Remember the latency service? between 200 milliseconds and 8 seconds. You can see the application tag I was mentioning here, initializer dashboard. You, you can see the instance. Uh, that's the name of the job in the primitives uh, endpoint. You can see it's a get um, that worked uh, successfully. And you can see the URI. So this is really the method we've been working on the whole time. So we don't know much, right? We know it's slow because we are currently targeting it. Um, but what I, want, what I want to show you now is how you can actually extract way more data. And to do that, uh, to make sure it's a bit more fun, uh, let's use Grafana instead. So if I use Grafana, uh, the, um, for those of you who don't know that monitoring system, they, they have on their website a feature where you can share a dashboard with anyone. So you can compose a dashboard, save it as a JSON file, and just upload the JSON file to the website with some uh, description of what the dashboard does. And there is a default dashboard for Macrometer for a Spring Boot application. So this is actually the default dashboard. You, you get all this for free. And then you can compose on top of that. So let's add a panel. Uh, and let's say what I'm interested in now is the client request. And I want to filter by application. So I want to say um, only this application. Uh, and the application is defined here, right? You can see that there are two applications being monitored at the moment. So this is the application tag right here in Grafana. Uh, this is actually not very uh, readable. So we can change the legend to only include a URI. And if we do that, uh, we can see that we have a yellow line on the top here, and it's matching a client request to the free reverse lookup. Now you see it. So that's the second line. Reverse lookup free with the IP. So we know what, what component is actually issuing the problem. The component that's slow is that damn free reverse lookup. Notice that you didn't have to do anything for that to happen. Remember I told you about REST template builder and the web client builder that we've uh, implemented to help you migrate uh, to the new API? If you use that and the application is, is uh, exposing metrics, it will automatically also expose HTTP client metrics. So you don't have to do anything uh, the same way you didn't have to do anything to collect uh, server metrics. So we know the problem is the, the free uh, reverse lookup. So let's try to fix that. And hopefully, there is actually two of them. And there is one I'm not calling at the moment because I have to pay to use it. So let's assume you have a uh, free service and you have another service that's really fast, but you have to pay to use it. And of course, if the free service works, there is no reason for you to use the paying service, right? That would be stupid. But if it doesn't work, um, like right now, it probably very uh, heavily used, it might make sense for your user to actually use the paying service. So how would you implement that with an imperative model? Right? How would you say, 
uh, let's issue a query to that service. Oh, that's taking too much time. Let's cancel it and let's issue another one. How would you do that with an imper in an imper imperative fashion with the REST template? It's not very easy to do. But I want to show you that once you've put that infrastructure in place, it's actually very easy to reuse um, the operators that Project Reactor provides. So let's go back to our method. So this is the key. This is this one. And what I want to say is, um, I want to say if this one reaches, reach, reaches a timeout, right? So let's do it like that. Let's say two seconds. I want an alternative strategy. All right, let's see what happens. You can see the application restarting behind the scenes. You can see it's faster now, right? The thing I want to mention is timeout is a generic operator on a publisher. It doesn't know about HTTP. It doesn't know it's, an, it's a web client call. It doesn't care about that. But the implementation of the publisher uh, will receive a cancel signal. So it will say, um, you've subscribed to me, uh, but I've subscribed to you, rather. Um, but forget it, I changed my mind. Uh, it's, been it's been two seconds. I'm waiting for, for the event with the data. You haven't provided that to me, so forget it. And the implementation, which is an HTTP client, will automatically cancel uh, the call for you and the call to the uh, fallback. So basically, the fallback is also a publisher. It can be anything. It doesn't have to be an HTTP client, really. Um, uh, the fallback will be subscribed to. So if we look at the, at the data here, we can see now that the uh, free reverse lookup is below two seconds, right? as you would expect. Let's have a look to a more complete dashboard. So I told you about tags as a way to filter data. So this graph here shows you the, the usage of the free service versus the paying service. So I never know about the color. So the, the, fr the green is the, the non-free service for some reason, and the yellow is the free service. And you can, you can see that as soon as we've added that timeout in place, the, the, the other service was used. And um, right now, I have like more or less 75% of chance to be around above two seconds, more or less. Uh, so there is a high chance that I'm going to use the paying service. Right. So uh, one thing I don't have the time to show you, because we only have like seven minutes left, um, is this is currently hard-coded. I don't want that. That's not really friendly. So I want to check out very quickly, rather than implementing that, uh, a way to externalize that. So the way you externalize that with Spring Boot, uh, well, one way, is you uh, create a data type for it. So you create a structure, a data structure. And there is a feature in, in Spring Boot called, called configuration properties, which allows you to bind value from the environment to a uh, well-defined structure. So this is basically saying that dashboard dot reverse lookup dot timeout um, if you set it in the environment, it will automatically set the value. So I'm guessing there is on, there's no, no value here. Probably not. OK, I probably need to recompile. And if we look at the service, the service simply injects the object, extract the timeout. Then you can basically use the timeout in your own code. But the interesting bit is in the scope of that code, you manipulate an object. You don't know where, where the data is coming from. You don't know it's coming from the environment. You don't care. Uh, it's a bunch of options for uh, some of your business logic. 
and uh, the fact that it's exposed as configuration key is an implementation detail. Right. Also interesting, um, you know about the great, I'm sure the great ID support we have in Spring Boot for configuration keys, uh, where if you want to configure Spring Boot, you have auto completion, uh, you type a few keystroke, and uh, you get suggestions with the documentation and the default value and everything. Uh, this behavior is in, in no way uh, specific to Spring Boot. You can actually use that in your own application, which is what I'm doing here. So let's change the timeout to be uh, 300 milliseconds, for instance. And again, that's going to uh, recompile my code automatically. So you can see now it's way faster. It replies al almost immediately. But if we look at the, at the Grafana, we can see that the invocation of the paying service is skyrocketing, of course, uh, because the tolerance is very, very low. Something else you could also do um, is you could add your own metrics to your application. So let's say you have a, a business value you would like to uh, monitor. Uh, you can actually create metrics yourself. So uh, one way to do that is if you look again, I'll share the I'll share the the, the project with you in a minute. So one way to do that is to inject a, an object called meter registry, uh, which is really a way for you to create new metrics, basically. And that meter registry, so what it does here, so that's the code below, is not only the free service can be slow, but if you invoke it too much time, it will at some point, it will reject uh, any, uh, any access. So let me show you in practice how that works. So if you call it too many times, it will zip. Uh, you, are, you, are, you are abusing the system. I'm not uh, letting you through. And if we look at uh, uh, every time you call the service, um, there is a header, a response header with the rate limiting, which gives you the exact value that's remaining. So this is a way for you to uh, collect that metric. So it's a filter on the web client. So this is the name of the metric here, reverse lookup rate limit rem remaining. So that's the key uh, you're going to use for the metric. So you, you are basically creating a new gauge with an atomic integer. And then there's a filter. And the filter, what it does is it checks if uh, the response has the rate limiting value. And if it has a rate limiting value, it's simply passing that to the gauge. So it's, it's basically saying these are the numbers of um, remaining calls that you have. And you can, you can very easily uh, add such a gauge in Grafana. So this is the, this is the key uh, that was used in my code. So it, it will basically show you an extra uh, dashboard with the key. So let's show that in action very quickly. Right. So you can see now that we have a value here. And of course, it's a, it's a bucket. So it will give you 25. I believe it's 25 per minute. That seems a bit low. But I, I don't remember what the value is. But as soon as you, as you don't use the service, the, bu the bucket will refill. So if I'm now really abusing the system again, then we'll see that the, that gauge will go back uh, to, uh, to zero. Eventually, there's always some kind of latency, of course. There you go. All right, so this is the um, project. If you want to have a look in detail, there is an extra feature I didn't have the time to show you today. Uh, there is a feature that shows you how you can stream data from the backend up to the client. So it's really a, a use case of live view of the number of uh, projects being generated by the dashboard. So it's, uh, it's the backend that exposes a, an infinite flux of data. The dashboard on the server is calling that uh, service, and it will broadcast the data to every browser. 
So it, it's a use case that's even, even a bit more involved. It would actually take me 20 minutes to explain it properly. But if you want to have a look, uh, it's the last commit um, in this project. And uh, if you have any question, please let me know. I, I will be at the conference today and tomorrow. Thank you very much.